Happy Sunday. Welcome to the Land Timber Stream. Uh, wrap, wrapping up the weekend here in the U.S. anyway. And just checking something. I'm trying something different with the lighting here. Just uh, always experimenting. Always experimenting. Uh, hope you're having a good weekend. I've had a very busy day, I have to say. I've been hitting it pretty hard. And even though I haven't advanced a lot in my schedule... I think I've made a lot of good progress in some comprehension, understanding, learning. And I want to go over that, uh, talk about a few other things. This is a Cat's Eye Nebula, by the way. Hey, Callum, good to have you. I know it's late where you're at. Uh, thank you for joining. Good to see you. Yeah, Cat's Eye Nebula. I've discovered this uh, site, the Chandra, Chandra X-ray Observatory website, where they share a lot of images, and they're just mind-boggling. So... Probably using a lot of those for my wallpapers of the day here going forward. Here's my agenda, those folks. Uh, Spanish tree thought experiment, first Python script, 49 days. So let's talk first about a simple Python script. It started out very simple, but I'm in this mindset now where, you know, I'm on a new team and we are working on cloud engineering and automation. And one thing that I'm trying to get in the mentality of, and I'm already in the mentality of, is just, is there anything that I'm doing repetitively, even for my own personal business, for the stream, whatever, and how can I automate? So there's this process I do every day. It's real simple. Like I have a stream agendas folder, right? And every day I come in here and I basically make a copy of the file from yesterday. I do a copy paste and then I rename it to today's date and I go in and edit it. I do that pretty much every single day. I'm like, all right, I know I do this in bash, but I need to learn a little bit more about Python. And that turned into about a two hour thing, which is okay. It did cut in my CCI writing and switching study time, but it's something that I kind of need to do anyway for um, what I'm working on. And it was beneficial. So I ended up writing this script called New Agenda well, this is the bash script to launch the Python script. And just getting some, it, it was great to do my first real Python script. It felt good. Like it's not uh, super complicated. I did upload it. Well, it's actually part of this existing repo. So let me see if it opens the right thing. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, yeah, so I went to, you know, Hank Preston's site uh, on Cisco NetDev. Went, uh, went back through the first lesson, which I've been in. I did some Google searches. I did some copy-paste. I've got a function here to determine today's date. Subtract one for yesterday's date. Build the path. Build a variable for, you know, define what yesterday's file name will be, today's file name will be. And then I'm using the, um, I'd import the SHUtil library, copy file. And I just use that. I do the copy file source destination. It's simple as that. Uh, but I learned a lot doing it. I had to fix some Python things. It's really cool because in VS Code, it it's so intelligent. Like VS Code, when I was working on it the other day on a PowerShell script, it's like, hey, you should install the PowerShell script extension. Click here. Or today, it was like, you should enable the Python extension. Click here. I try to do that. Of course, anything in Python is at least my experience, is not as simple as one, two, three. Like just upgrading Python or, you know, it's to, configure Python and write context. There were, it, that's what took me so long. It wasn't actually developing a script. It was getting Python libraries properly configured on this Mac. And it was also a problem of, uh, VS Code was like, okay, this is a Python script. So it automatically prompted me and said, hey, uh, you need to install PyLint. I tried to do it. I couldn't do it. Here's the problem. So I went in, and that took me a while. Set the right environment variables, and it's always, I don't know. I've, ne I've had really bad success getting my Python environment set up. Uh, hopefully, I'll get better at that. I'm sure I will as time goes on. But anyway. That took some time, but yeah, I'm, you know, it worked. And I'm going to try to do that more often. And it's if you want to take a look at it, it is in the repo with the agendas that I upload every day. So, uh, yeah, so this week I've done, for the first time in a long time, 
a PowerShell script. I did that yesterday. Uh, today I did a Python script and a Bash script, which I've done Bash scripts here and there, you know, throughout my career. But anyway, it felt good. And that's kind of in line with what I've been working on. All right, let's talk to Spanning Tree. So my goal this weekend was to start working on in the networklessons.com, you know, course, CCIE Routing and Switching written course, was to start working on um, multicast spanning tree, or sorry, multicast layer two. Never got there. I was hoping to get there today, and I was stuck on this loop guard configuration. And again, uh, where I was hung up, not on the loop guard feature itself, but there's something, there were some integral parts of spanning tree that I kept telling myself, like, I'm not really sure I understand exactly what's going on here, and I need to. So I went back to basics. I went back to basic spanning tree, how does spanning tree work? And I'll show you what I mean. It wasn't that, oh, like I forgot everything I know about spanning tree. Not that at all. But where I often have gotten hung up on these optional, you know, classic spanning tree features, really I think goes back to a couple of very foundational uh, parts of spanning tree protocol logic that I either did not have them down correctly or did not understand fundamentally what the process was. So, uh, and I know that sounds lame, but I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. And I thought, you know, how have I resolved this before? Well, recently I've come across this thing of a, uh, conducting a thought experiment. Um, so that's what I did, and I wrote out all the steps, and I've got them here. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, like one, one big hang-up I had is, okay, what's the difference really between blocking and listening, right? Because with block, uh, a port that is in the blocking state, you're still receiving uh, BPDUs and looking at BPDUs. What's the difference between that and listening, you know? What really is fundamentally the difference? Uh, also, you know, which port states would change based on timers and what port states could change due to other triggers besides a timer running out? You know, when would, for example, a port transition from forwarding to blocking? Uh, when could it transition? Um, hey, hey, thank you for the auto host, Blind Hacker. Appreciate it as always. And so when would you, you know, also the port states, like when could you transition? Let's say you're going from blocking to listening to learning. Is there ever, ever a scenario where you would transition from learning to listening? Um, also, could you transition into the blocking state from any other state? So, again, very subtle things, but... Fundamental, and I think if you don't understand those, it's hard to really get these these optional features and how they actually work. So we'll do our little thought experiment here. Uh, let me pull up my notes, and I've had this lab up all day, and I've been playing with it. Some of the answers I could not find in the documentation. Like I had very specific questions about certain scenarios, couldn't find an answer. So what do you do? Well, you lab it and you watch. It's the best way, right? All right, so let's talk about this. Our, our thought experiment here um, is we have two switches connected to each other that boot at exactly the same time. And they converge at exactly the same time. So let's go through that thought experiment and just analyze bit by bit what is going to happen with spanning tree, right? And a couple of known behaviors about spanning tree. One is that uh, this was confusing to me too a little bit. When does a port state, or I'm sorry, when does a port type change? So for example, when you transition from um, listening to learning, it's 15 seconds, right? That is the forward delay timer. Let's say a BPDU comes in and I figure out, okay, this port is going to need to be the root port. So when does when does a switch actually mark 
that port as a root port? Does it wait until the listening state is over? Or does it sort of cue that up and then leave the port in the state that it was previously? Um, maybe it was alternate port. Like, when does it happen? Well, what I found out, I actually watched. And basically, the switch is going to calculate and assign this immediately, regardless of the port state. So, as an example here, and I watched this. So, even though you're in the listening state, if the switch, based on all the information it has, determines that a particular port is, the, is going to be the root port, once the state changes the forwarding, it, it changes the port state, or port type, I should say, right away. Uh, at, you know, we get into that type versus state, right? So, port type. So, it's going to automatically assign the port type right away, um, which makes sense, right? The other thing, known behavior, we have to, before we, you know, go down this thought experiment is, one... Classic expanding tree protocol is never at rest. In other words, it maintains a state machine for each spanning tree protocol instance, whether you're using per VLAN spanning tree instances or you're doing multiple spanning tree instances. So each switch is always maintaining a state machine. You know, what is which bridge is the root? How does the root bridge BPDU compare to my? you know, my priority, right? Which port is the root port? Which port wins? Which port is the root port? Which port should be um, designated? And which port should be uh, blocking or alternate, right? It is constantly, there's a state machine with these timers. It is timer-based. So it is never at rest, unlike, you know, uh, which is different from rapid spanning tree protocol, right? Rapid spanning tree protocol gets into a, a state and it pretty much stays there unless there's a particular trigger, right? Mentors, Eddie's Devil Dogs, no need to stand when I enter the chat. <laughs> One moment. I <laughs> got the salute, mentors. Uh, good to have you, man. Glad you could join in. Um, so, yeah, that is the. You know, one is root clearly understanding the port type when that changes, the port state when that changes, and the fact that the port state is uh, never a constant, right? It is always in flux. And um, there are various triggers. One is, as I said, timers, and the other is a topology change BPDU, right? Either a topology change BPDU, which comes from the root, or a topology change notification, BPDU, which could come from any other switch. Um, also, there are other conditions that can signal changes and trigger a recalculation, right? We talked about that when we looked at uplink fast. So I have a, my root port goes down. That is a trigger that is going to, um, that is a change that is going to trigger a specific action. I'm going to bypass a listening and learning state on an alternate port and immediately moving to move it to the forwarding state, right? Uh, so anyway, with those behaviors in mind, going back to our thought experiment, let's talk about the transition from each port state. We got these two switches, right? And in this uh, experiment, we're talking about switch two and switch three. So these boot at exactly the same time, do you know, to some sort of manipulation of physics, you know, which is, this would never, like, the likelihood of this ever occurring in real life is, is so minimal. But um, anyway, let's assume they boot exactly the same time and that they're actually not connected. Switch one is not here. So just imagine it's not here at all. It's just switch, switch two and switch three. So initially, when you boot a switch, right, if you've ever watched the console, it takes a minute for the ports to actually become to come up. So either that so the disabled state means that the ports are either shut down administratively. So even after the operating system boots and everything comes online, 
the port will stay disabled from spanning tree's point of view because it'll be shut down or the ports are known by the operating system by you know this the the switch but until they actually come online and are connected they're essentially from spanning tree's point of view they're disabled right but the next state they come into would be blocking so no switch on boot up is going to bypass or no port is going to bypass the blocking state right unless of course it's like port fast enabled uh, then it'll transition immediately to forwarding right but a non-port fast port a non-edge port is first going to go to blocking and in blocking mode it's going to receive bpdus and forward those to the switch module so as soon as the port comes up hey do i see anything but of course in our particular case in our thought experiment they're both blocking at the same time so they're not receiving any bpdus they could like if if switch one were really existed in our thought experiment and it was it has already been up when this switch boots and these ports come online and go to connected they'll go to blocking and they'll start receiving and becoming aware of the topology right they're going to become aware of receiving bpdus now one thing that i wasn't sure of and i had to test this to find out is how quickly can a port transition a port state transition to and from blocking mode right we know about the forward delay timer does that apply to the blocking port state well it turns out it does not right so you can go from disabled to blocking immediately and from blocking to disabled immediately of course you can go from forwarding to blocking immediately from listening to blocking from learning to blocking and from forwarding to blocking in other words you can go to a reduced functionality port state from any port state to blocking immediately so uh, learning state for example and we'll get into this but you know if it learns that that port needs to be blocked it will become blocked right away it doesn't have to wait on a timer now going the other way you see that only in two two cases right unless you're using some special features like port fast uplink fast one of the fasts uh, you can only go from blocking to a higher level of functionality like blocking to listening you can't go from blocking to learning you can't go from blocking to forwarding um, oh this is duplicated isn't it listening learning forwarding yeah so you can't go the other way around we can always degrade your status right away but we can't upgrade your status until we've gone through the motions right it, except in the case of blocking to um, listening we can do that right away right uh, when will we do that so in this case um, both ports are blocking and you know the switch comes online and it has not received any bp we're in blocking mode it has not received any bpdus right away but what happens with a switch when it first comes online it thinks it's the boss so both switch two and switch three say okay i'm the root bridge right now so what they're going to want to do is send a bpdu they haven't received any but what will happen is switch two and switch three at the same time they're going to transition from disabled to blocking to l listening uh, right away okay it's all going to happen at the same time so switch two thinks he's boss switch three thinks he's boss they generate a bpd frame and they forward it on the interface at that point the port state moves to listening now what's the difference between listening and blocking this is what confused the heck out of me right um, one is when the port transitions to listening state you start the forward delay timer of 15 seconds in other words i can't upgrade the port no matter what happens i'm not going to be able to upgrade the port for another 15 seconds in class expanding tree okay i can receive bpdus 
I can make decisions about BPDUs because I've sent a BPDU, right? And at some point, switch two and switch three at the same time are going to receive each other's BPDUs. So I can make a decision. I can actually change. I should put that here. Um, can receive BPDUs. Can send BPDUs. So of all things, this is probably the biggest difference between blocking and listening. So we are still blocking all traffic that's not BPDUs, right? Uh, of course, CDP, other, some other traffic like that. But as far as normal uh, data traffic, not control traffic, but data plane, we're not forwarding any frames and we're discarding uh, frames. So I should put that in here. Can receive BPDUs, can now send BPDUs. Discards, frames, and data plane. I know this is very specific, but this is what I needed. Well, let's see, can receive VPDUs and blocking. Um, Mentor says this would vary with different iOS switch images, correct? It should not vary too much, Mentors, because um i think this is pretty much i mean it may first of all the timers i would not expect to vary too much um and the actual behaviors i would not expect to vary too much because there has to be an agreement that more often you know it's not uncommon to have spanning tree um running Spanning tree instances that span multiple switches, right, between Cisco and non-Cisco. So we have to have, we have to follow the RFC where we can uh, to, for these behaviors to, to work, I would think. I have not seen any cases of that, but I could be very, very wrong. Okay, for Boom InfoSec, hey, how, how's it going? Good to have you. Good to have you live on the stream. Appreciate uh, you hanging out. Hope this is beneficial. Um, good stuff, guys. Hope everybody's having a good Sunday. So, yeah, we're talking about spanning tree states, right? Uh, port states, uh, blocking and listening. And I struggled with this for a while. And until I actually started this thought experiment and reading, I was like, what is the big difference between blocking and listening? You're still getting BPDUs. True, but you're not sending any BPDUs and blocking, right? Uh, also, in blocking, you're discarding... Discards, other frames in data plane. Not learning MAC addresses. Not learning MAC addresses. So something else that we're doing in listening mode is we're looking to see, okay, can I upgrade this port? Mentor, span a tree can get very deep if you choose to go down that rabbit hole. So true, man. And, and I'll admit, I have gone down the rabbit hole somewhat. But I'm telling you, um, I, I got some things wrong on the last two written exams because I, I think I didn't understand this process well enough. This basic process about the port states and the triggers. Um, so... Hopefully this, was, this will pay off, you know. I, re I really do hope it, it pays off. Um, so yeah, in listening state, we're still not learning MAC addresses, but we can decide, okay, what's the best PDU I've got? Decides the best PDU and modifies port type as needed. So listening state can actually mark, change a port type to be root, or it could change the port type to be um, designated. Even though it changes the port type to root, it doesn't mean we're in a state where we can forward frames, right? But listening mode can do that. Blocking mode cannot. In blocking mode, your ports are always going to be alternate. I should put that here too. Um, 
port type will always be alternate. The other thing we can do in listening mode is we're sending the best BP to you. So, you know, if we started the listening state at the first second and we sent ours, so let's think about our, our two switches here, right? We got switch two and switch three, our thought experiment. They're both blocking. And as soon as they transmit their own BP to you, because they both think they're the boss, as soon as they transmit their BP to use, switch two and switch three, the port state goes to listening mode and they start this 15 second timer. What happens? They, they receive each other's BP to you. So here's what happens. Switch um, three receives switch two's BP to you. So this BPDU comes here, and switch three says, oh, all right, his priority is better than mine. So what happens? Even though there's a listening timer running, remember what we said, switch three can make a decision and say, hey, switch twos is better. So you know what? These ports are going to be transitioned to blocking. They're going to go back to blocking. And we, we you know, I could actually demonstrate that. Why not? Why the heck not? Let's go full screen. And I'm loving this more every day as I play with this, these iframes. I, d I looked up if there's a way that you can, um, if there's any keystrokes to allow you to toggle between. That's the biggest complaint I have is I want to not have to click on the the outline to get to this iframe um but there is none <laughs> there is no keystroke to do that that i know of uh so we've got these three interfaces right show interface gi12 show interface gi12 okay we're going to shut them all down interface range gi0 2, GI10, GI12, shut. Interface range, GI02, GI10, GI12, shut. For simplicity, we'll probably just go back and focus um, on a single interface, right? Uh, let's undebug all and then debug spanning tree events. So this will tell you the, when the port state changes, right? So let's just pick on interface GI02. Interface, let's see, for your terminal, interface GI02. And they're both shut down. So obviously we cannot simulate them both coming up at exactly the same time. But what we can say is we know that switch three is going to have the inferior BP to you. So let's actually bring him up first and wait till he goes to the listening state, which he should immediately. Okay, it's listening. Uh, which one we're we talking about? We're talking about going, yeah. So let's do no shut. Okay, we actually did that a little late, so he already went to learning, but notice what happens. As soon as he receives a superior BPDU, switch three is like, okay, you win. I'm gonna go right back to blocking, okay? So we can downgrade immediately. We cannot upgrade until the timer lets us do that, right? So this is, that's what happened here. Went to listening, and if you do show Interface GI zero show span. Do show span interface GI zero two. Well, I didn't catch it in time, but let's do that again. Shut. And then we'll do no shut. Notice it's already said, okay, this port is designated. So 
it's already changed the port role or the port type. And the status is listening. So it could change the, the role at any time. I should say role here instead of uh, type. Now we're in learning. And soon we'll be in designated forwarding. There we go. All right, so let's go back to uh, Spanish tree can get very deep. Choose go down. There. Have you uploaded any PCAPs we can view? Lol, yeah. Never mind. You're gonna demo. Yeah. The uh, that's the thing about the PCAPs. Like I have so Spanning tree uh, BPDU PCAPs in the share, but PCAPs. This is mostly about like the Spanning tree calculation that the switch does. So the 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 actual BPDUs aren't gonna change that much. They're only going to change when, you know, essentially they're changing when there's a topology, there's certain flags, right? There's a topology change notification flag. So that will be turned on for 35 seconds and then it gets set back to not in a topology change, right? So the BPDs are going to pretty much look the same. Um, but yeah, I can definitely do some here in a minute. All right, go, in, go back to listening. Let's change. I need to figure out my keystrokes here on VS Code. I want to learn VS Code, like bad. Like I want to learn the... Uh, let's see. Let's do VS Code keyboard shortcuts. I need to just leave this on my desktop for a while. I'm a big shortcut person. I don't know about you all. Uh, oh, we need to change some Google stuff. Chrome. I switched back to Chrome. I'm not on uh, Firefox. Firefox would not update this chat window, which annoyed me to no end. Made it pretty much useless. Um, all right, decides the SVPD or modified port is type as needed. Yeah, so let's check out the shortcut for find and replace control h it's just like notepad <laughs> awesome that'll be easy to remember i think control h oh this is for windows darn okay um Well, shoot. Let me see if I can find them for Mac. VS Code keyboard shortcuts for Mac. Hey, hey, here we go. They've got them. Goodbye, Windows. Man, I'm going to have to... I hope I don't have to learn too many different... All right, command option F. All right. Sweet. All right, so we're going to say port type with port role. And command option enter. Nice. Okay. So listening. Um, Decides the best PDU modify and modifies port role as needed. And it sends the best PDU. Now, again, if switch two, in our thought experiment, there's only switch two and switch three. So switch two is going to be originating the best BPDU every hello time. While this timer is still, while this clock is ticking. Or in the case of this topology, for example... It's going to just relay switch one's BPDU, which is the best. Um, okay. So it will transition. Actually, that was worded okay. So it's evaluating what the next state should be. 
you know, assumes learning and then will transition to learning at the end of the forward delay timer, 15 seconds. Learning state. Okay, we send and receive VPDU still. Um, discards, other frames in the data plane. However, we are learning MAC addresses. So we're populating the CAM table. That's the difference. We're still doing everything that listening is doing. Um, we're sending best BP to you. And we'll transition to forwarding state at the end of the timer. All right. That's it. There's some really cool other things. There's some other great things I learned uh, reviewing. This is really rabbit holy right here. Uh, this link. And it has things like uh, what we talked about the other day, the spanning tree radius. I think it was show or mentors to correct me on this. I was saying 20. It is 7 for sure. And it has their other timers, which I'm not going to try to memorize those. But as you can see there, there's an end-to-end -end BPD propagation delay, which everything is based on. The LO timers, everything else. So that really helped me, you know. So what we're going to do is, based on uh, this, we're just going to go ahead and do this loop guard lab real quick. And again, when we talk about triggers, if we look, let's look at our environment here. So we've got switch two and switch three. Ports are up. We do show span interface GI02. We are designated. Show span interface GI02. On switch three, we're blocking, right? Which which we expect. Switch two has better BPDUs. All right, so the situation that loop guard is helping to prevent is a loop cause when you have an interface like a fiber interface, for example, that has different circuitry for transmit and receive. So you could easily have a scenario, right, where Spanny Tree fun. Hey, DeBizzle. Yeah, man, I'm still having, I, I am actually having fun with Spanny Tree. I know that's nerdy as hell, but <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Um, and I'm trying to get, I want to be so determined that I'm going to get every Spanish tree question on the next written exam. That's the goal. It's going to happen. It's just going to happen, folks. So here we are, VLAN 1. And this is blocking. This is forwarding. It is designated. But let's say switch 2 and, and switch 3 are connected via the fiber uh, patch cable. And it has fiber module connector modules on each end. And the transmitter on J02 on switch to fails. So switch three can send, his port is up, and he can send, he can transmit over the, the, the fiber. Switch two can receive, but is unable to send on the fiber. So what's the rule here, right? Well, on switch three, this is a trigger. What happens? Let's uh, do a capture here, and I'll show you. We'll do a capture here, mentors, because this is, this is a good capture to do, I think. This will actually illustrate pretty well the problem where you're going to get a loop. So let's capture. Oh, that's the only issue with this HTML5. Okay, capture GI02. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, let me make sure. Okay, it's configured with port fast. Let's take that off for right now.
and and let's see show run loop okay it's not configured there loop guard i had this configured earlier Cool, it's not configured there. All right, so one way to emulate this, I don't have a fiber cable, right? Let's say, let's say the little, uh, we got a little rat up in the attic. Have y'all ever seen this? I've actually seen cables chewed by rats. And I, I remember we were doing a, a fellow engineer and I were working on a wireless project at a school. And we're actually deploying, like upgrading all their access points you know, where you get on the ladder, you got one guy on the ladder, one another guy with the cable, and, you know, he, had, uh, he got up there, and he found a rat underneath the uh, ceiling tile. Uh, yes, it does happen. <laughs> that was so gross, man. But y'all know how it is when you pull the ceiling tiles out, if, you, if you've done your fair share of wireless. Um, you never know what you're going to find. And, uh, man, I've... I've gotten some allergy attacks from all the crap that's come down uh, out of a ceiling tile before. Uh, Mentor says, always nice to be that guy who has a specific technology. I one day shall find my niche. OSPF equals show spanning tree equals LAN. We have multicast still and several. Others. I know there's so much, man. So much. Um, all right. So this looks good. We've got switch to... All right, so notice that switch three is not sending any BPDUs. Oops, I got to click the bar. I keep forgetting. Right, these are all coming from two. And as far as that goes, that's good because as we know, if we look at a BPDU, okay, we have in here something called the max age, which is 20 seconds. Uh, this message age is one second. So it'll actually be what the spanning tree protocol says is that you need to assume that the time between switch two will receive that PDU and he will relay it. You're not going to try to calculate that, really. You're just going to assume that's going to take up to maximum of one second. So switch three is going to have 19 seconds, really, before he decides that this BPDU is out of date. So let's do that. And how do you think we could filter? How could we emulate a fiber transmitter going down? Well, I learned this from networklessons.com. What we're going to do is first we're going to uh, make these ports port fast. Because with port fast, we can turn on a particular feature that will filter BPDUs. Can you think of what it's called? Uh, spanning tree, port fast. And this is network type. In some images, some uh, gear, you would say here, port fast uh, trunk. But on this image, the way you do that is you're going to say port fast type is network. Be careful not to DOS yourself again, Lan. Oh, you're no fun, mentors. <laughs> that was so much fun yesterday, man. I'm actually going to create a loop here. We'll, we'll see what happens. This should be fun. Spanning tree. And I've done this before. I remember when I first, when I was working on the CCMP, and I was doing Chris Bryant's material. And I was using physical switches. And the first time I locked up my switch, like, you know, in a lab, I've seen it happen in production, too. Um, because we had, like, a flapping uh, interface, a trunk interface. So I've seen spanning tree lock up switches. But the first time I did it at home using my own switch it was it was fun uh we're about to do it here in the lab i hope all right so with port fast what feature can we use to prevent an interface from sending bpdus 
BPDU filter, right? And of course, for BPDU filter to be on, port fast has to be on. That's why we did that. So here's what we expect. In our thought experiment, this fiber transmitter fails, and this switch three no longer receives BPDUs on this interface. And it should take 19 seconds for that timer to expire. And it determined that there, A, there's been a topology change, and that this port should now transition from blocking to listening. Then it will transition to learning, and then it will transition to forwarding. So what's happening in this case? Let's say we have router uh, host R5 down here is sending packets to host R4. And I'm trying to see how we could actually emulate the loop. Yeah, what's going to happen is switch two is going to say um, this host is here and it's here. Because switch three is going to forward, it's going to forward this frame, uh, this interface and this interface, and it's going to come back here. And switch two is going to say, okay, I need to forward this to every port except the one that it was received on. So it's going to forward it here and here, and this one will get to the right place. Switch three will get it and say, okay, I need to forward this to every frame except the one I learned it on. Well, it should by now know that this frame is here. Let's see what happens here. Let me make sure that these are up. Uh, let's go to switch to R5. Ping 192.168.1.4. And let's repeat. Okay. All right, so let's put BPD filter on here. Enable. All right, so watch what happens here on switch three. Let's restart this capture. Okay, I don't have a timer running, but okay, there we go. So now, um, switch three is, is doing what we said. It is now transitioning this port to the... I'm going to put my ping up here because I know you can't see it where my head is. So this is transition to listening. And after 15 seconds, it goes to learning. And after 15 more seconds, it should go to forwarding. And this should create some confusion here. We can see that um, switch three is still no longer receiving BP to use from switch two. Okay, so now we have a new PB, BPDU being sent from switch three to switch two. Switch two thinks that all is good in the world. And I don't know if this is enough traffic to crash, but let's look at our uh, ICMP frames. Let's look at all our frames, actually. So let's see, where does switch to think that that host is located? 
show ARP. Actually, show Mac. Okay, so it doesn't look like we have a loop. However, we're obviously not taking the optimal path. Um, let me see if there is a way to create this crash condition here. Let me look back at network lessons, because I think it was demonstrated there. So obviously what it's doing is it's going it's going uh this way instead of this way. Okay, I'm gonna look back at this lesson real quick. Bear with me. And let's see, loop guard and UDLD is, a, is just one lesson. Yeah, it's just, uh, I don't think it's real easy to demonstrate here. Which is pings. Uh oh, what just happened? There we go. I think we finally show proc CPU. Okay, just took it a bit longer on uh, in the virtual environment here. In fact, this thing is like running sluggish now. Oh, I think I broke it. Show proc CPU. Uh, let's do show proc CPU history. Wow, it's getting hard to show proc CPU history. Oh yeah, we're breaking it, folks. Look at that. We did it, mentors. I knew we could. Okay, so there's therein lies the problem. <laughs> I think this is going to continue to go up because you really have frames basically going around and around and around. Oh yeah. Uh-oh. We broke it. It's broken. Houston, we have a problem. Roger that. Ground control to Major Tom. <laughs> okay, look, guys. I mean, it's like... Oh, we're, we're broke. Yeah, we're, we're busted. We're busted good. So I wasn't sure I'd be able to replicate this on the VM, but phew, I'm telling you, you know, in a real environment where you've got hardware, you've got ASICs transmitting, you know, at quote unquote wire speed, this will actually happen a lot faster. Uh, yeah. How, how, all right, this is, we're going to, just for fun, we're going to see if we can render the, the switch useless, okay? Let's see if we can get to 100 and actually crash, 
crash the, the environment. Why not, right? All right, ty type one if you want the, the environment to crash and burn. Type two if you want me to save it. How's that? <laughs> if you want me to rescue it, type two. If you want it to crash and burn, type one. <laughs> Unanimous uh, so far. So we're up to 85. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. We got tracebacks now. We got CPU hogs. Oh, yeah. Let's try to do it over here. Switch one must be going nuts, man. Switch one must be just... What is wrong with you? Oh, yeah. I can't... I can't even... I can't even... I'm going millennial on you guys. I can't even... Oh, yeah, it's like, that's what loops do, class. Loops will melt your network. Show CPU history. <laughs> it's a meatloaf. Eat your bologna mentors. That's why I make you bologna sandwiches every morning. Meatloaf is for Saturdays. What day is it, Mentor? <laughs> all right, it's not... All right, this switch is not struggling as much as... Oh, yeah, this show proc CPU history. All right, so as we can see, it has been slowly building and building... And now I can't hardly type any commands. All right, so we've seen this before, folks. I'm going to let that run for a second, just see what happens. And then um, loop guard. So what loop guard is going to do is it's going to say, if you enable loop guard on both sides, it's going to say, all right, for any port that is non-designated, Right, so in this environment, oh yeah, it, we got into then we got into the nineties. <laughs> I think it's slowly melting down such to the point where it can't. Uh, but basically, in, in this topology here, for example, we're going to say switch two. This is a designated port, so designated is not expecting to receive BPDUs, but on any other port where you are expecting to receive BPDUs. So that would be a port role that is root or alternate. So you can configure that manually or you can configure it globally. And when you do it globally, what will happen is um, anytime, in any of the ports that are of the role root or alternate, that if they stop receiving BPDUs, instead of waiting on the timer, because the timer works, the max age timer does what it's supposed to do. Disclaimer, do not try any of this at work. Educational purpose only. Yes, please do not try this at work <laughs> and say the land timer told me so. Um, so. So, yeah, when it's expecting to receive BPDUs, what it's going to do is it's going to bypass the max age. It's going to say, hey, uh, I should be receiving BPDUs, and I think, how many does it wait? That I do need to look up. Uh, let's check real quick. You break it, you bought it. That's right. Uh, loop guard transition. No. This is your standard document here. It might say loop guard.
Okay, one of the ports is physically redundant topology. No longer receives BPDUs. The Spanish group conceives that the topology is loop-free. Eventually, the blocking port from the alternator backup port becomes designated and moves to the forwarding state. The loop guard makes additional checks. If BPDUs are not received, that port is moved in the spanning tree loop inconsistent blocking state instead of the listening learning forwarding state. Without the loop guard feature, the port assumes a designated port role. The port moves to the spanning tree forwarding. Oh, right, right. Okay, yeah, I had that wrong. So I was thinking of, I'm not sure what I was thinking of, but what, what this does is it prevents that transition to forwarding state. So instead of the port transitioning from, yeah, I had that wrong. All right, so instead of the port transitioning from alternate to forwarding, or to alternate, in this case, uh, listening, learning, forwarding, it puts the port into um, port inconsistent state. Yeah, BPD is now receiving a trunk port from one particular VLAN. Only that VLAN is blocked. That's correct. It is a per VLAN protocol. This is where it gets tricky. And I remember reading this. So, This is why you need it on the root ports also, because a root port could transition to a blocking port. Good stuff. So let's... Uh, okay, it's still, <laughs> it's still hung. I am going to have to rescue the lab just so that I can do this uh, loop guard. Oh, yeah, we locked her up real good. I may not be able to recover. Uh, what I could do is say... Are your terminal interface j 3 or two, no spanning tree BP, oh no, it's actually spanning tree BPDU filter disable. Come on, help me, help me. Still hasn't put my command in there yet. There we go. Okay. Boom. Order is restored in the universe. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to actually, at the global level, we're going to say spanning tree loop guard default. Spanning tree loop guard default. Okay, life is now returning to normal. Yay. All right. Uh, I did not want to close that browser. Darn it. Yep, you passed and got your CCI number, Lan. Congrats. Yay. Imagine having to TS and fix this ticket in the CCI exam lab and having the clock ticking. It's your time to save the network. That's right. I would not be surprised. I would love to now to get a T-shoot or Diag on spanning tree loops. Throw them at me, man. Throw them at me. All 
Okay, so now we're back to normal. We have Spanny Tree Loop Guard turned on, and we're going to do the same test. Uh, show run. Actually, you can do show interface jazz zero two spanning tree. No, show span interface jazz zero two detail. Loop guard is enabled by default on the port. Okay. Show proc CPU history. Okay, we're we're down. We're back down to the teens. And we're going to do another ping, extended ping here. I think about to go ahead and get the Eve Pro. You like it, huh? Put it on my laptop, though. There you go. Yeah, what I did, uh, Debizzle, is there's no harm in uh, install. It's just time, of course. But as you can see here, I've got GNS3 and even Eve Pro on um, you know, I just have two virtual machines and I just fire up whichever obviously I wouldn't try to fire them both up at the same time. I don't have that many resources, but but yeah, it works. So we're gonna put BPDU filter back on. Interface GI02, Spanning Tree, BPD filter, enable. Show span interface GI02. Did I enable it here? Oh, there we go. All right. So it probably weighted the four delay time value of 50. Oh, no, it weighted the max age of 19 seconds, 20 minus one. And as we could see here now, show uh, span interface GI02. Looping consistent. And look at the status. It's broken. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so this is good. We're, we're not using the most optimal path, but we're not looping frames, right? So this is broken. This port did not transition to forwarding. Instead, it's uh, looping consistent. And pings are now traveling the long way, but they're getting there, and we have a loop-free topology still, right? Um, now, what I want to do is look at this other case I was talking about. Uh, the says, is there a problem moving the license thing? If I want to maybe change my desktop later. Okay, so the license is tied to, if you have the pro version it is going to be tied to your installation so the licensing process was a little finicky like it's it's definitely if you try to move the virtual machine it's going to know and you're going to have to re-license it viral is kind of like that too right so so it's basically like the way viral was um so yeah i hope that that helps but customer support is great, man. I have to say, I've I haven't I've only used them a few times, and the customer support is really good. The actual support forum, the chat, is good. So you go to evenG.net and they have a chat, and it's very active. Like you usually get a response pretty quick if you're having an issue. And I did have an issue with a license, or I had some confusion, and somebody helped me out. So. Uh, all right, what was this other scenario? I just want to make sure I understand that. When, it, when it's talking about the root ports, um, let's look at the my history here.
Okay, it says... Cool, they would help me repurpose my license then if I need to. They would, yes. They, they would definitely help you out. I see what you mean. You want to put it on your laptop first and then move it. Um, now what you could do, the way I use it on my laptop, the Bizzle is, um, I don't know, it could be a disk space restriction or something like that, but um, I, I actually still use, like I run, this uh, iMac as a desktop. But when I go into the living room and mess around, I use my laptop, but I just um, browse to the IP of the EVNG server that's sitting in here on the desktop. And that works for me pretty well, anyway. So that's an option. You could do that. Um, Okay, so it says the loop guard feature is enabled on a per port. However, as long as it blocks the port on the Spanish tree level, loop guard blocks inconsistent ports on a per VLAN basis. That is, if it, yeah, for the same reason, if enable an Ether channel interface, the entire channel is blocked for a particular VLAN, not just one link. That is a disadvantage. Um, Qig then will decide to upgrade my Eve. Yeah, queuing looks promising. It really does. Let's see. On which ports should LubeGuard be enabled? Okay, the most obvious answer is on the blocking ports. However, it's not totally correct. LubeGuard must be enabled on the non-designated ports. Root and alternate. For all possible combinations of active topologies. As long as LubeGuard is not a perfect root VLAN feature, the same port might be designated for one and non-designated for the other. Very important point. And there, I won't get into this, folks. There's a lot of discussion on loop guard versus UDLD. There are a lot of use cases where you might want to use one, you might use the other, or you might use both. Um, I'm not going to get into all that. Uh, Network Lesson has a really good forum on that, where they talk about that. Uh, let's see. It'll probably be a while. I wonder if they plan on charging. Probably same model like even G Free Community Offer Pro, I would imagine. I would think so, too. Mentors on QIG. Um, so, that leads us to our trivia answer. Uh, yesterday, the trivia question was, what are load balancing options on a multi-layer switch? So, of course, you may or may not remember, but the command is IP MLS load sharing. You know, router is different, right? Uh, doing load sharing on routed interfaces is one thing, but, you know, generally you rely on routing protocols and... Um, the forwarding information base is determined most often by uh, Ceph and your Ceph configuration. But on switches, it's a little bit of a different animal because you have traffic that is layer 2. You have traffic that is uh, layer 2 and layer 3 and layer 4. The switch, today's switches can actually look at layer 4 as well, right? So there are a number of options here. And I'm just going to review here on the side. Like, I didn't get them all right myself. So to make sure I don't tell you the wrong thing. Uh, by the way, if anyone remembers, that's great. Go shoot for it, right? But these words may come to, come to mind, right? You've got full. Simple. <laughs> um, you've got full, simple. And then you've got this really tr tricky thing where you can do full uh, exclude, um, yeah, port destination, full exclude port source, yeah. 
So these are the main ones that I'm aware of. This will definitely vary by platform, okay? This definitely will vary by platform, but basically, as many know, when you have switching, uh, let me go to my little topology here. So let's say this would really apply like if you had a layer. So we have a layer three interface. And what if we had, um, this, right? So I could have on router four, I could have a loopback interface, right? And I could have two equal cost path links through switch two. And let's say switch two is actually a multi-layer switch, right? We're talking about multi-layer switches. And it has a routing and it's running EIGRP. So the way it's gonna decide to forward the traffic on the multi-layer switch is uh, it can be full, and full is going to be layer 3 and layer 4 information. Multiple adjacencies. And simple will be just layer 3 information, not multiple adjacencies. And full simple... Uh, is going to be, let's see, layer 3 and layer 4 information, not multiple adjacencies. And full exclude port is only going to be layer 4 source information. And this will be uh, layer 4 destination information only those are the answers i'm not going to try to explain that because i'm not i don't do a good job of it yet i probably need to review this some more to be honest i just re i'd already reviewed this about a month ago on network lessons network lessons actually explains this better than where i've seen explained a lot of places but uh that is what that means Uh, obviously, as you can see, this is going to be the best in most cases. Full. But it's going to utilize more resources to determine this, right? All right, next trivia crash question for tomorrow. What are the steps in order to configure NetFlow on a router interface? You need several components, right, to configure NetFlow. How would you do that? Um, you know, try to think of it in your head if you get it, maybe. If not, you can try to, you know, maybe do a little research for tomorrow. And tomorrow we will have the answer. Um, and that's about it, folks. I have one meat chunk, and that is a new repo. So this, these notes that I wrote for switching, uh, for spanning tree, you may remember I had in Google Drive, I had a reference sheets well, I've now transitioned that to the um, to a new repo on GitHub, so you can clone it if you find that helpful. And the link is here, so you can go to my GitHub site. You can go to it that way, or you can just clone that link to your local repository. And what I have here is. Um, SDN comparisons, acronyms, Ansible, BGP diverse path notes. Uh, the drill sheet is here. Uh, code examples, diff serve, IPv6. You know, a lot of things that are, I try to put my mini notes in the written drills just for memorization practice. But for things that required more involved notes than like this one, um, I put them in this repo, which you're free to copy. Free to clone, if you like. And that's all I got, folks. Thanks for hanging out with me this, this Sunday. I uh, really enjoyed it. 
And man, I'm just, you know, we're going to keep blazing a trail, learning what we can. Uh, wish everybody luck on their, in, you know, good bits in their labs and their studies. And hey, folks, tomorrow is, starts a new week. Let's um, get a plan together. What are we going to accomplish next week? How far are we going to get? And let's put it into practice. You know, maybe we use tonight to sort of map out our week, what we want to get done. Uh, mentor says, had another fun informational day. Definitely going to finish up my INATS Lab 3. Only two more tickets left. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I, I want to go back. I came on and the stream had ended just like 30 minutes prior. I was so involved in what I was doing, so I missed, uh, I missed that. But I want to go back and just kind of see a summary of how that went. Yes, see peeps later tonight. We'll show, as always, with Lan on Monday. You're welcome, Callum and DeBizzle. And uh, thanks for hanging out and encouraging me and giving me feedback and uh, helping me destroy my lab. Uh, thanks, folks. Thanks a lot. No, <laughs> it was actually kind of fun. And uh, we'll have some more fun, fun tomorrow. We'll continue on Layer 2, uh, two, and hopefully we'll be getting into some multicast. Yeah, buddy, Big A, love seeing the CPU. Love seeing the circuits melt. Melt them all. Burn them all. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Uh, appreciate you stopping by. We shall see you back here tomorrow night. Same time, same place, 7 p.m. Eastern, here on a Land Tamer stream. Y'all have a good night, folks.